Have you ever wondered about the fate of the Russian dynasty? And if you already know their tragic end, have you ever thought of what led to their devastating downfall? Prepare to uncover the explosive reasons behind the assassination of Tsar Nicholas II and his family. We'll unravel a web of discontent, political turmoil, and tragic missteps that sealed the fate of Russia's last monarch. Welcome to Intriguing Icons, and get ready for a pulse-pounding journey to the abolishment of the Romanov dynasty. Tsar Nicholas was the last Tsar of Russia. He belonged to the Romanov dynasty, which ruled in Russia from 1613 to 1917, with figures like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great being renowned political geniuses. Nicholas Alexandrovich was born on May 18, 1868, in Tsarsko Selo, as the eldest child of Tsar Alexander III and his wife Maria Fyodorovna. Nicholas was well known for his gentle disposition, prioritizing his family life over ceremonial obligations. In November 1894, shortly after succeeding his late father, Nicholas married the German princess Alex of Hesse-Darmstadt, who assumed the name Alexandra Fyodorovna upon their marriage. The couple's first four children were daughters, Olga in 1895, Tatiana in 1897, Maria in 1899, and Anastasia in 1901. They were later blessed with a son, Alexei, in 1904. The birth of Alexei held great significance due to the requirement of male succession to the throne. Tragically, it was discovered that Alexei suffered from hemophilia, a condition that prevented his blood from clotting naturally. This revelation instilled immense anxiety within the Tsarist family, as any bleeding incident jeopardized the survival of the Romanov dynasty. Consequently, in 1907, the deeply troubled monk Grigory Rasputin was brought into the inner circle of the royal family. Rasputin was intended to heal Alexei, but ended up being a source of scandal and gossip. Until 1894, the family had enjoyed a harmonious existence, with no notion of the tragic fate that lay ahead. However, the winds of change soon swept in, bringing forth a series of catastrophic events that hurried the downfall of the Russian dynasty. Tsar Nicholas II ascended the throne in 1894, following the death of his father, Tsar Alexander III. But his reign was marked by a series of serious missteps and ill-fated decisions. First, let's delve into the dreadful event that cast a dark shadow on the start of his reign, the coronation tragedy. Let's set the stage. It was May 26, 1896, and the grand city of Moscow was buzzing with excitement. The entire nation eagerly awaited the coronation of Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Alexandra. The coronation was meant to be a joyous occasion, symbolizing the continuity of the Romanov dynasty and the Tsar's divine right to rule. However, unbeknownst to the royal family and the thousands of spectators who flocked to witness the event, tragedy lurked around the corner. The chosen location for the post-coronation celebrations was the Kodinka Field, a vast open space on the outskirts of Moscow. The authorities had arranged for free food, beer, and commemorative gifts for the people to enjoy. As the day of the coronation dawned, excitement reached a fever pitch. People from all walks of life, desperate to partake in the festivities, gathered at the field, hoping to catch a glimpse of the Tsar and receive their share of the celebratory provisions. The guests were offered complimentary coronation keepsakes like cups, glasses, and textiles. Leading up to the event, there were speculations that more substantial gifts, including livestock, horses, and even entire farmhouses were distributed. These enticing rumors drew enormous crowds, with as many as 500,000 people converging on the festivities. But what should have been a day of joy quickly descended into tragedy. The crowd grew restless and impatient, eager to secure their gifts and food. In their eagerness, a rumor began to spread that there would not be enough for everyone. Fear and panic gripped the crowd as people surged forward, jostling and trampling one another in a desperate scramble to get their hands on the promised tokens of the coronation. The field, once a site of celebration, became a field of sorrow and despair. In light of this, Nicholas and Alexandra resolved to proceed with the celebration. After all, the extensive preparations, notably the scheduled ball at the French ambassador's residence, had incurred a substantial expenditure, and it seemed wasteful to cancel it. The coronation tragedy shook the nation to its core. It exposed the deep-rooted problems within Russian society, 
the stark divide between the ruling class and the common people, the inadequacies of the authorities in managing large-scale events, and the glaring inequalities that fueled discontent. The tragedy also tarnished the image of the royal family. The public's perception of Nicholas II and Alexandra shifted. Many saw their failure to address the tragedy promptly as a sign of their disconnect from the struggles of the Russian people. The coronation tragedy would forever be etched in the collective memory of the Russian people. It was a stark reminder of the fragility of power, the consequences of mismanagement, and the urgent need for change. The second significant factor that led to the Tsar's downfall was his mishandling of Russia's involvement in World War I. The war put an enormous strain on the Russian economy and resulted in widespread suffering among the people. When war erupted in Europe in 1914, Russia found itself drawn into the conflict due to its alliances and geopolitical interests. Initially, there was a surge of patriotic enthusiasm as the Russian people rallied behind their country's participation. However, despite the initial enthusiasm, Russia's entry into the war quickly revealed significant shortcomings within the country's military, economy, and leadership. These deficiencies would contribute to a series of devastating consequences. One of the primary challenges faced by Nicholas II was the ill-preparedness of the Russian military. Despite having a vast army, it lacked modern equipment, adequate supplies, and effective leadership. To make matters worse, Nicholas's decision to assume direct command of the Russian army further worsened the problems. His lack of military experience and the resulting detachment from political affairs created a leadership vacuum that would prove disastrous. Meanwhile, back on the home front, Russia was grappling with severe economic strains. The demands of the war effort strained the already fragile infrastructure and exacerbated social inequality. Food shortages, inflation, and discontent began to grip the nation. The deteriorating socio-economic conditions gave rise to growing unrest and political dissent. Workers, peasants, and intellectuals began to question the Tsarist regime, blaming Nicholas II for their suffering and demanding political reforms. Adding to the challenges was the influence of Tsarina Alexandra and her confidant, Rasputin. Alexandra's German heritage and Rasputin's questionable reputation created a perception of foreign influence at the heart of the Russian court. Amidst this backdrop of internal instability, Nicholas II's decision-making regarding the war efforts remained questionable. He resisted calls for political reforms and failed to address the pressing needs of the Russian people. The military campaign itself was marked by a series of disastrous setbacks. Russia experienced significant losses on the Eastern Front, including the devastating defeat at the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914, where the Russian army suffered heavy casualties. As the war dragged on, morale plummeted among the troops, and instances of desertion became increasingly common. The Russian army, once seen as a symbol of strength, was now demoralized and disenchanted. With the socio-economic and political climate ripe for change, various revolutionary movements gained traction, each with their own vision for a new Russia. Among them, the Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Lenin, emerged as a force to be reckoned with. In February 1917, the Russian people reached a tipping point. Mass protests and strikes erupted in Petrograd, demanding an end to the war, food shortages, and political reforms. The military, which had been called upon to quell the unrest, instead joined the revolution, turning their guns on the Tsarist regime. Now let's find out the consequences for the Tsarist family. On March 15, 1917, Tsar Nicholas II officially abdicated the throne at the request of the newly formed provisional government. The pressure to abdicate came from all directions, including within his own family. It was seen as the only way to salvage the Tsarist throne and the empire itself as the country was engulfed in revolution. Nearly everyone, including Nicholas himself, breathed a sigh of relief following his abdication. However, his wife Alexandra was furious when she learned the news. In addition to resigning the throne for himself, Nicholas also abdicated on behalf of his son. This move resonated with those who sought to preserve the monarchy. If young Alexei had ascended the throne, he would have been unable to rule at his age, allowing the Tsar to avoid political turmoil. However, Nicholas knew his son's precarious health condition and did not want to be separated from him. Nicholas's brother Michael, the next in line for succession, declined the throne, effectively marking the end of the Tsarist regime. 
Only a few months later, the monarchy was officially abolished. Nicholas was subsequently held as a prisoner. Initially, he resided with his family and part of his court in one of his palaces in Tsarskoye Selo near Petrograd. He still enjoyed certain comforts and perhaps found some relief from the burdens of his rule. Initially, it was expected that he would go into exile. King George V of Great Britain, his full cousin, extended an invitation to him. However, this offer was met with protests from the British left, leading George to withdraw his invitation. The French government also declined to grant him asylum. No country was willing to host the former Tsar. On August 1, 1917, the provisional government instructed the Romanovs to pack their belongings. They were to be relocated to Tobolsk in Siberia, a safer place for them. In the middle of the night, they departed with 39 guards on a Red Cross train. Their suitcases were filled with jewels, cleverly concealed beneath personal documents like letters and diaries. In Tobolsk, they resided in a small two-story house where they were extremely bored. Nicholas spent his time chopping wood while his daughters struck up friendships with the guards. On October 25, 1917, under Lenin's leadership, the Bolsheviks seized power in Russia and shortly thereafter made peace with the Germans. However, this did not resolve the domestic tensions. A civil war erupted between the Reds and the Whites, the opponents of the Bolsheviks. The new regime was fragile, and Lenin sought internal enemies. The Romanovs became convenient scapegoats. In the spring of 1918, the Bolsheviks relocated the family to a Pachev house in Yekaterinburg, situated in the Urals. Upon their arrival, a hostile crowd jeered at them, demanding hang them. The house, surrounded by a high fence and with its windows painted white, was stifling. The Romanovs were now unquestionably prisoners, although some of their guards secretly sympathized with them. These sympathetic guards clandestinely provided books, letters, and food to the family. Nicholas received correspondence from individuals who wished to assist him and his family in escaping. Remarkably, a romance even blossomed between Maria, the most beautiful daughter, and one of the guards. However, Yekaterinburg was situated perilously close to the front lines between the Red and White armies. In support of the White forces, English, French, and American troops had landed in Murmansk. Within the Bolshevik leadership, an idea emerged that the family should not fall into the hands of the enemy and would be executed if the enemy drew too near. Despite his earlier call to eliminate as many Romanovs as possible, Lenin hesitated. He actually preferred to see Nicholas brought to trial. Additionally, he grappled with the dilemma of what to do with the children. The Bolsheviks drew inspiration from the actions of the French revolutionaries, who had executed Louis XVI and his wife in 1793, but had spared their children. It was clear that such an act by the Russian revolutionaries would likely tarnish their image abroad. By mid-July, Yekaterinburg was on the brink of falling. In their diaries, the Romanovs noted that they could hear the artillery thundering. Time was running out. The Bolshevik leader Yakov Yurovsky was granted permission to prepare for the execution. He was assisted by Peter Yermakov, a member of the Secret Service and a complete psychopath who had decapitated someone during a bank robbery. After the abdication followed the gruesome execution. On the night of July 17, 1918, the former Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, his wife, and his five children were awakened by their doctor. They were still staying in the house in Yekaterinburg, the main city in the Urals, under strict surveillance by Bolshevik troops. Around 2 o'clock, Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov, as the ex-Tsar was called, descended the stairs. He carried his 13-year-old son Alexei, who suffered from hemophilia and was still recovering from a hemorrhage. They were followed by his wife Alexandra and their four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia, their doctor, a personal chef, a footman, and a chambermaid. They proceeded to the basement, guided by the advice that gunfire had erupted in the town and they would be safe underground. Inside the basement, they were made to wait. Alexandra and the ill Alexei were provided with chairs while the others remained standing. Within moments, a dozen armed soldiers entered the confined space. Their leader, Yakov Yurovsky, read aloud a statement. Nikolai Alexandrovich, considering your family's ongoing opposition to Soviet Russia, the Ural Executive Committee has resolved to carry out your execution. Startled, Nicholas asked, What? What? Yurovsky quickly repeated the words, and immediately thereafter, the men aimed their rifles and began firing. 
Yurovsky himself fired a colt at the ex-Tsar who immediately fell down. Although the intention was for everything to be over quickly, there was a whirlwind of shooting for a few moments. When the shooting stopped, the victims were laying on the ground. Although they had been hit from a few feet away, some appeared to be alive. Yurovsky fired two more bullets into Alexei's head. Some of the women were finished off with bayonet stings. Afterwards, the killers discovered that Nicholas's wife and daughters wore a lot of sewn-in diamonds in their corsets, altogether more than a kilogram, on which quite a few bullets had rebounded. The corpses were immediately loaded onto a truck which was waiting in the courtyard with the engine running to hide the noise of the shots. Thereafter, they were transferred to an abandoned mine nearby where they were dumped in a shaft. The next day, they were once more collected to relocate to a different mine. Regrettably, the truck became trapped in the muddy terrain. Consequently, Yurovsky made the decision to bury the bodies in a nearby forest. To render their identities unrecognizable, sulfuric acid was applied to their faces. It was only after the collapse of the Soviet regime that the remains were eventually retrieved. The perpetrators were agents of the local Cheka, the organization founded by the Bolsheviks that would become the secret police. That Nicholas II had to die was decided long before. Trotsky later called the decision right but also necessary. It seemed the logic of the revolution. Lenin, whose own brother was hanged for an assassination plot against the Tsar, said sarcastically, In England and France they executed their king a few centuries ago. We were late with ours. Nicholas and Alexandra had helped cause their own downfall through their misrule, but their children were obviously innocent, as were the murdered servants. They had never even been arrested but had voluntarily followed their parents. The Russian revolutionaries had a history of violence and upheaval. In the final decades of the Tsarist Empire, numerous attacks occurred, culminating in the assassination of the Tsar himself. The notion of eliminating the entire imperial family, the Romanovs, had been contemplated earlier. In reality, the Bolsheviks pursued the eradication of the entire dynasty. Nicholas's brother and presumed successor Michael had been discreetly assassinated several weeks prior. In the days following the tragic event in Yekaterinburg, other relatives met their demise, sometimes in even more horrifying circumstances. Only a handful of Romanovs managed to escape this fate. Two days following the tragic events, on July 19th, the Russian government announced worldwide that Nicholas had been fatally shot to prevent his capture by the Czechoslovak gangs. Simultaneously, it was reported that Alexandra and Alexei had been relocated to a secure location. This story, perhaps aimed at maintaining cautious relations with Germany, held particular significance. Alexandra was, after all, a full cousin to the German emperor, and her brother governed the German state of Hesse. The fact that she and her children had been killed remained confined to a very limited circle, despite the rapid spread of rumors. The confirmation of their deaths would only come years later. The uncertainty surrounding the fate of the Tsar's children contributed to occasional claims that one of them had survived. Subsequently, approximately 20 individuals came forward asserting to be a son or daughter of Nicholas or descended from him. However, their claims were proven to be inaccurate, particularly as the remains of the victims had by then been discovered and identified. It's worth noting that there was little mourning for the last Tsar's death. Most Russians responded with indifference, or in some cases, derision and scorn upon learning the news. Furthermore, it was soon alleged that Nicholas had been assassinated by the Jews. While this assertion was not entirely accurate, it's notable that the leader of the execution squad, Yurovsky, had Jewish heritage, as did Goloshchekin and Sverdlov. This led to unjust reprisals against innocent Jews by some factions during the civil war among the whites. Even today, this accusation has not been completely forgotten in Russia. The assassination of Tsar Nicholas II marked a turning point in Russian history. It represented the culmination of years of social, political, and economic unrest, as well as the rise of revolutionary movements that fundamentally reshaped the country. Thanks for watching. Now you've learned everything about the Tsar's downfall. Click here to watch another video about the diabolical things Lenin did.